Right. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. This webinar is organized by the Centers of International Business Education at Michigan State University and Texas A&M University as part of our Research Spotlight series. The topic of today's webinar is international business education and teaching. For this webinar, we invited the editors of three prominent journals in the IB field, and they will discuss their perspectives on IB education and teaching and publishing work in this area. This webinar will include short presentations followed by a discussion moderated by the co-hosts. David and I will be your co-hosts today. My name is Ahmed Kurja, and I'm delighted and honored to be here with you today. I'm an Associate Professor of International Business and Marketing at Michigan State University Broad College. I also serve as the Director of the International Business Center, MSU Cyber at MSU. Um, first, I would like to thank our participants and panelists for agreeing to join us for today's webinar and introduce our panelists. Uh, our first speaker is Professor uh, Ying Lu Wu, co-editor of the Journal of Teaching and International Business. Dr. Wu is an associate professor of marketing at Bowler School of Business. Dr. Wu received her PhD in marketing and Master of Applied Statistics from Louisiana State University. Uh, she offers expertise in online marketing strategies through both quantitative and qualitative analysis of consumer online shopping behavior, and companies' online activities. Our next panelist is Professor Rudolf Sinkovitz, co-editor-in-chief of Critical Perspectives on International Business. Dr. Sinkovitz is Professor of Strategy and International Business at Durham University, United Kingdom, and visiting professor at Lut University, at U2 University, Finland. Uh, he previously worked at the University of Glasgow, University of Auckland, University of Manchester, and uh, WU Vienna, Austria. His research covers issues of interorganizational governance and the role of advanced technologies, focusing on responsible businesses. And our third panelist is Professor Boniface Michael, editor-in-chief of the Journal of International Business Education, International Educa Journal of International Education in Business. Dr. Michael uh, is a professor of management and organizations in the College of Business at California State University, Sacramento. He researches and teaches organizational change with a focus on collaboration, founders' values, and its association with employees' commitment patterns, knowledge management, and solutions-oriented organizational performance. Now I will pass the proverbial microphone back to David who will lead the discussions during this panel. Enjoy. Howdy, y'all. Welcome very much from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Just want to give a quick heads up in terms of um, the Q&A. So during each panelist presentation, if you have any questions, you can either send them to me directly, you can put them in the chat, or you can add them to the Q&A. We will be collecting them, and then Amit and I will lead the Q&A after all three panelists have been able to give um, their presentations. So without further ado, please allow me to turn the presentations over to Dr. Wu. Great. Um, thank you for the invitations, I and mean, it's uh, truly an honor to be able to share some of my perspectives. Um, let me share my screen. There might be a little bit delay, I think just the connection, um, but it should be, let me know if at, at certain point. good to go. That, okay. Oh, hey, um, so um, I'm Ying Lu Wu. Um, I'm a co-editor of General Teaching International Business and also currently a professor at um, Bolo College of Business at John Kerry University. We are a little bit outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so in preparing my thoughts about um, teaching in an education in international business and also publishing this field, um, I felt it would be nice to kind of have an overview framework in terms of what is relevant to uh, teaching in education in IB. Um, so based on the review of the IB teaching and education literature, 
I kind of summarized the topics and insight relevant to the field into three categories. So which are shown here that include the IB education content, the instruction and design and the pedagogy and then business school internationalization. And then the last part in the last sessions and I offer some of my perspective in terms of publishing research in teaching and education in IB. So I kind of group the key learning IB outcomes into three categories, which are listed here. Um, and I'll offer some examples under each categories. And please know that this is not an exhaustive list, but rather a framework of how to connecting the different um, IB content components. So the first uh, category is in the re relevant to IB, IB teaching and education is the business proficiencies, right? So this pertains to um, a, a blend of core business disciplines where business functional knowledge applied within an international or global context, um, such as like international marketing or international finance. Um, this truly emphasize the interdisciplinary natures of international business and also the interplay of economics and business on a global scale. So any research relevant to any of the sub subtopics will be considered within the scope of IB education and teaching. The second very important category is that really, uh, of IB education is centers around the global perspectives. This is about preparing students to effectively understand, adapt to, and operate within the diverse cultures and the market environments. So examples of associated concepts are cross-cultural intelligence, cross-cultural competence, um, cultural agility, global mindset, and global citizenship. The third category of skill sets emphasize on the international communication skills. So this can range from anyway from language proficiency to competence in global communications, virtual communication skills, and also um, managing group dynamics and handling conflicts. So given the wide range of topics that are covered by IB education, so some are relative have a relatively longer history of being taught by business schools, others are relatively emerging things. So a, a, one way really to identify what topics it's worth of researching is ongoing examinations of the involved needs of the industry, right? Like the multinational companies or global companies and to align the content of our education with the needs and address those demands. So for example, are there theories or perspectives that require updates or are there emerging top important topics that have not well integrated into current IB curriculums? So let me give you some examples. Um, well, this might not be the latest examples, but they do reflect ongoing efforts of aligning course content with industry needs. So one example is a study that we published in JTIP in 2010 that looking at the integrations of international accounting components into MBA pro curriculums, um, the other example is a published uh, articles in 2018 uh, within a special issue series about um, international entrepreneurship education. So this article is examining the key outcomes from both perspective of educators and practitioners for international entrepreneurship programs. So now we've, we've continued to see some major trend, trends that really shaped international business landscape. And I believe that the, later on the panelists will cover more about this topics. Um, some of the common things that we have continued to see such as a technology advancement, sustainability, uh, global telemanagement, diverse workforce. Um, so we, as educators that we really need to reflect on is what we educating our IB students, do we prepare or do we adapt our IB, our education sufficiently to address those shifts? So if, if we use like technology as example, right, like innovations like AI, blockchain, virtual reality, mobile, those are really driving force for cross-border e-commerce, 
global supply chains, right? Um, global virtual collaborations. So do we prepare students to possess sufficient skills and uh, knowledge of those technologies? Do they have enough skills in big data analytics? Do they have knowledge of how this technology is gonna influence international business? To be a little more specific, here's an example. I know it might be small, um, but it's a quite long list, but this is a recent article in 2024 um, that look at the different ways that AI has uh, in terms of potential applications in the various st strategies or practices within multinational companies. So as educators, then we need to think about, uh, do we prepare students to face this shift in company practices uh, across different business, educate, uh, business functions? So in summary, revealing the gaps between the educational content and industry needs is an excellent way to identify the important topics um, that are worth of researching. And then the second areas of, of IB education and teaching research then focus on the pedagogical improvements. So it is important to understand the common pedagogies that have been studied and reviewed in IB teaching. Um, some of the practices are, um, for example, experiential learning. Some are interdisciplinary approach. Some are technology enhanced learning. Some are cross-cultural collaborative learning. So here are some examples that I've listed here about the common pedagogies that we have seen and reviewed in, in the IB teaching. Um, in the pursuit of the pedagogical improvement, two areas and two focuses that we highly value uh, at JTIP. Um, there are, first is the high impact cost effective pedagogies. Then the second area will be a deeper dive into the pedagogical effectiveness across uh, different consumer groups, different consumer types. So let me give you a little bit more um, information on the first point. Um, so we all know that uh, unlike other business disciplines where students typically see the real world applications around them, IB students typically need a lot of more immersive experiences to truly understand the complexity of business in foreign markets. So while immersive learning methods like a study abroad are highly effective, but they can also be very costly making them less accessible to many students. So that's why we encourage creative and innovative approaches to developing low cost pedagogies that still offer meaningful immersive learning. So for example, um, a study published in JTIP earlier this year, um, the authors look at how to utilize virtual service learning to foster the cross-border interactions between students and business owner. Another example, um, actually published in 2021 from the International Journal of Human Computer Interaction, um, the authors explore how to use virtual reality to enhance the cultural learning. So this kind of approaches show that we can use technologies to make impactful IB learning with lower costs for our students. So the third area of IB education focuses on um, the higher level of curriculum and the program design, and also the aspects of business school internationalization. Um, so two areas that we feel are important to examine. The first is the insight into adapting IB education across cultures and countries, especially from the views of developing and emerging markets. Um, Examining IB education beyond a dominant Western-centric perspective has been a long-lasting call. Um, we still believe it remains a critically important issue due to the involving global dynamics. So at JTIP, we have a history of publishing special issues on IB teaching in specific regions like Pacific Basin, Asian Pacific regions, also Mexico Americas and the Spain perspectives. Um, the second area that's also um, very important is the digitalization of higher education and specifically driven by the growth of online and hybrid learning. 
there has been a lot of discussion in terms of pedagogies in this area about online and hybrid delivery format. However, I feel that um, at the program level, looking at the implication for program design and specifically for international business programs are relatively underexplored. All right, so based on those uh, two areas of research or two areas of um, relevant topics, um, I would like to share some of my thoughts on publishing the scholar relation uh, re research in this area. Um, some are based on my observation in terms of the common mistakes or misunderstanding of IB teaching journals. And the first, of course, it's a fit that we have heard a lot about fit. Um, but it is one of the most frequent reasons for desk rejections adjective. It's, it's a lack of fit. So either the paper focus on IB, but not on teaching or education, or the paper discuss teachings, but then lacks the IB context. Um, the second aspect of finding the fit, which may be less of an issue in business education disciplines, but I've noticed that there are more nuances in scholarship teaching and learning journals. For example, there are teaching journals that will focus exclusively on pedagogical discussions. So it is quite important to carefully review the journal's aims and scope to ensure that your submission is a good match. Um, second is highlight your contributions. For instance, if you study, if your study examines a widely discussed IP pedagogies like study abroad or global virtual teams, then ensure that you conduct a thorough review of the literature to justify your claims of contributions. So, um, also think about um, contribution in terms of generalizability, meaning that can your pedagogy be adapted by other educators in a different context, right? So it's always helpful as we suggest authors to include your own reflections as an instructor and also discuss key considerations for others to implement your approach. Then the third is provide evidence of effectiveness. Really to increase the rigor of educational research, we need to move towards more rigorous testing of learning effectiveness. So this means more theory-based learning outcome measures and also more rigorous testing. So related to this point, there are some ways that may, <clears throat> that may help you with collecting learning effectiveness data. Uh, for example, collaborating with other instructors and universities can really help you collect larger, more representative samples faster. Um, also, programs can think about building learning outcome assessment into regular, regular operations, such as student surveys, um, peer evaluations, or senior access surveys. You can also look for programs that actually supply student learning data, like the X Culture Projects. They're great resources for student learning data on the individual and also group level. Finally, um, also a suggestion is to consider the different publishing formats available. Many journals like JTIP will offer options beyond the traditional research articles. Um, so some examples are listing here. Uh, while smaller piece pieces are on as common as the traditional research articles, alternative formats are available and they can provide really good opportunities for for example, very new innovative ideas where you don't see much in the literature. So those are really good fit for a smaller piece. So those are my some of suggestions and I hope this comment help you navigating the publishing in IB teaching and education. Uh, if you have any question or thoughts that you would like to reach out, feel free to um, reach out to me or my co-editors, Dr. Feng Jen. Um, also, welcome to email any questions regard, you have regarding JTIP. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we're going to move directly into our next presentation with Dr. Sikovitz. If you can go ahead and share your slide deck, please add any questions into the chat or send them to me directly. 
Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to to speak to you on the topic of critical international business education and teaching. I should preface this conversation and this uh, brief introduction uh, from my end with the fact that CPOIE, Critical Perspectives on International Business, is not a dedicated uh, pedagogy journal. Uh, it's uh, one of the journals within the area of international business. I would argue it's a, a critical uh, uh, yeah, we uh, we are calling ourselves a critical perspective. I'll I'll come to that in a second. But it's a, um, a boutique journal, so it's uh, we are not pub publishing much. Uh, we will see shortly why that is. Uh, but we also think in the production of the of the topics, we think about dissemination and infusing the ideas into our uh, pedagogical and into our ed educational uh, practices. Uh, I should highlight it is uh, originating from Australia and the UK. You will, when you skim the uh, editorial team, you will see very quickly that there's a, a, a big footprint of European academics on the associate editor list, also the review board. And then there is also New Zealand people and uh, people from Australia. We also expanded into uh, uh, South America very, very um, dedicated uh, and, and plan, uh, willful planning in that direction because we think there's a lot of research to be captured and a lot of uh, unique practices to cap be captured. We also have a footprint in, in Africa. Uh, curiously, I've not been able to convince anybody from the US, but I think that is to do with the fact that, of course, uh, the uh, publication market is even more heightened and we are on the CABS, uh, AGG, the Academic Journal Guide, the British Association, we are uh, ranked two. Uh, of course, uh, we are not sort of in the crown jewel or the elite journal areas, but we are a very serious contender uh, in the production of credible, replicable and, and very good work. Generally, I should uh, go very briefly into a bit of a philosophical perspective here, uh, because we are titled Critical Perspectives on International Business. And uh, I was invited to join this conversation uh, uh, about uh, critical education and teaching in international business. And that was uh, kind of triggering the thought I should probably highlight uh, why we are called uh, uh, we are called critical perspectives on, and what's the difference really? So I think uh, as with, uh, for instance, cultural uh, methodologies or cultural approaches, emic ethic for IB researchers will be a clear uh, uh, perspective here. Uh, is this kind of the difference between are we taking an outsider view and looking in, zooming in on IB? And if you are taking an outsider perspective, uh, coming, for instance, from sociology or from anthropology. Uh, from from other disciplinary areas, then you of course might critique the field differently, and this is sometimes for some scholars in IB this is actually a turn off. So some of the scholars would never want to be associated uh, with uh, critical perspectives on international business because of the fact they are thinking wrongly. I should say that we are only interested in criticis criticizing or critiquing IB, right? Uh, like. Uh, let me let me um, uh, be perhaps a little bit more provocative, as if spitting on it. Right? That's not what we are doing. What we are doing, we are kind of keen to balance these perspectives. So the outside perspectives would mean we are challenging the orthodoxy and we are allowing papers like that. So if you are a person who is uh, interested, in, for instance, uh, in in ethical implications on globalization, or you are criticizing neoliberalism, then yes, you also have a chance to publish in our journal from this outsider perspective. But we are also, and very dominantly, of course, under my leadership is so the perspective of the insider view, looking and critiquing uh, or looking critically at the international business phenomena and practice from within the international business uh, th theoretical frameworks and, and backgrounds. So examining operational and, and practical issues to do with international business or uh, uh, simply addressing socioeconomic and ethical business challenging challenges. So we are doing both. We are having a concern. My mantra is usually when I'm talking about uh, CPOIB, then my mantra is usually the concern with societally engaged international business, meaning we are investigating and interested in publishing work that is to do with pressing contemporary issues. We have been the first on 
the global financial crisis. We have been the first on, on SDGs, really on global value chains. If you look at papers, we are innovative in the sense because uh, work that is perhaps not yet at the front, forefront of the methodological and theoretical development, of course, has an easier access. We are liking ideas, which otherwise we are, would probably have in the top journal, elite journal, certainly uh, a longer time to market. So that is a background against which I would like to highlight what usually are the themes and how do they then feed into teaching practices. So you will see, for instance, uh, upcoming in, in the third issue this year will be a critical perspective on international business education. So a, a team came in and, and proposed uh, this as a, as a kind of more pedagogical approach to IB. We have in the past uh, also been uh, introducing work and will come to the market in January with a, a, a set of papers on diversity, equity, and inclusion in international business. We have been challenging, grant challenged, uh, questioning effectively, is it really the case that the multinational enterprise is a, a, a solution a solver to grant uh, solutions or is there also potentially uh, negative implications associated with the emergence and with the activities of, of uh, uh, multinational businesses. So these kind of topics just broadly as a special issue uh, themes would tell you what the editors, what the editorial team, the associate editors are thinking and how we can make a good imprint. And in practical terms, uh, what does it look like for authors in terms of production? The paper types, of course, all of those are academic papers. Okay, we have of book reviews and so on. If, but we also, next to research papers, and that's what I'm trying to highlight here, we have also case studies. Although, curiously, I should say, despite the fact that I make quite a, a noise around this, uh, curiously, very few papers have been submitted, and so far, nothing has been materializing. And we also have what is quite new in the whole uh, wide world, I would argue, is so-called impact papers. That's not even in the submission system uh, yet, but it is something that I'm very keen on. And when I'm saying impact papers, uh, that will, of course, in the US audience, um, will trigger this notion of impact is related with with uh, citations, of course, that's something we are very interested in. And we are also scoring uh, uh, fervently in the altmetric score as an example, but we are thinking in the, around this more along the lines of REF, the research excellence framework that we are having in the UK, which defines uh, the impact as an, a benefit that is outside academia, which is kind of contributing dedicated, traceable, auditable benefits to uh, the economy, to society, to culture, uh, public policy, health, uh, these topics, if you can write a paper that shows, not necessarily at the, at the top level of academic rigor, but that shows that whatever you have published has transformed either business practice or has transformed the way we look at uh, the environment, quality of life, particular constituents, then you would have, uh, with CPOIB, a, a, a very credible uh, home uh, that is also ranked in, in international contexts. So I should uh, conclude with a couple of examples here uh, of papers uh, that we have recently been publishing. So for instance, a big debate uh, over the last uh, three years that uh, emerged at AIB conferences, the Warsaw in Seoul and in other panel discussions, there was this um, uh, launch of the book by Geoffrey Jones, a business historian at Harvard, and then the other team, Rob van Tulden, Evelyn van Miel from the Netherlands who have been working and devoting a lot of their academic life to notions of, of sustainability and sustainability education came to the light. So we have, for instance, now engaged with these authors, a whole author team with uh, colleagues, uh, including Pavida Pananond from Tamasat in Thailand and then uh, a colleague at York University uh, um, um, uh, and, and then colleagues uh, from other places too. So here you on the right side, you would see uh, the author lineup. Uh, we have engaged in what we call a dialogue, yeah, an, an analytic dialogue, author dialogue, interpreting the uh, succinct information of the book and we published it. And uh, in as a, as a viewpoint paper, uh, engaging with these books and it uh, shows basically very practical outcomes and implications for what we can do in terms of introducing methodologies, tools, uh, revised business models uh, in the educational context in the classroom. Another set of examples that I, I'm showing here 
would be a set of papers, for instance, one that is, has been re-examining, has been published in CPOIB, uh, which talks about social value destructions or the Bangladesh disaster in 2013. Who is really behind? Who can we blame? Is it multinationals? And it's a very critical analysis of uh, situations that are very difficult to capture. Similarly, uh, it's difficult to capture the tax avoidance. Uh, there is another discussion coming up soon. Oh, we had papers on corruption. We had papers on war. Uh, and what we do usually, this would be a selection of um, uh, topics here. What we do usually, what we're doing is we engage actively with those authors, uh, introduce video clips or supplementary author commentaries, as, as the example was indicating or is, is outlined here. Uh, we had uh, interviews and, and conversations with the authors of the terrorism paper, then um, uh, not very much, but uh, uh, Henry Foss from uh, Bristol University, for instance, uh, introduced recently the idea that we uh, should engage increasingly with uh, system th perspective, system thinking in international business education. We had papers on, on the, SD the SDG uh, contributions. And we also have uh, recently had a, a number of um, high level and uh, more practical level discussions, uh, which in the GMS uh, journal, for instance, Journal of Management Studies, it would be called point counterpoint we call it or perspectives papers we call it viewpoint papers uh, debate papers so we had for instance recently a set of three authors Raskovic, Voss and Burmester who were engaging with the wicked problems so these are papers when submitted uh, I in that case for instance as editor-in-chief I detected there are potential uh, controversies in these papers. So uh, Raskowitz highlighted the advantages of this wicked problem thinking, wicked problem theories. I thought, well, there's an alternative perspective that could be opened up. And then basically slowly we invited people to make uh, provocative uh, counter statements and, and counterpoints. And that is basically something that we have recently been publishing. Also introduced, as you see on the uh, screen, uh, right, uh, bot, uh, right top, angle of, of the screen, uh, we had a, a series of uh, uh, joint debates uh, which are on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, as an example. Or there was another set of papers, Mats Forsgren, Mo Yamin, and then uh, we're quite famous for the book on the transnational uh, Grazia Yetogilis, who all had sort of different perspectives, right? So uh, Forsgren had with some other uh, uh, colleagues uh, done a gyps paper uh, on on the M E as sort of God given creature uh, and questioned it and then there was a discussion in gyps about this. We also mirrored this discussion. Uh, in our case, it is the question on uh, whether the M E is indeed the crown of the creation. So these papers, I would argue, uh, would do and serve very well. And indeed, we are using some of our authors' constituents are reporting back that they're using them with pleasure in, for instance, MSc level and also PhD level teaching. And finally, I would complete or finish off this brief introduction uh, with uh, activities that are an outcome, for instance, of the engagement with uh, uh, with uh, Geoffrey Jones and of the engagement with uh, Rob Van Tulder, uh, the idea to transform some of the thinking into poster. So we are also engaging some of our associate editors uh, are prominently embedded in an initiative that comes out of AIB UKI, the UK, UKI, the UK and Ireland chapter of the Ac Ac Academy of International Business, a global poster competition hosted at Leeds University and really, as you can see from these images here, sponsored by numerous uh, constituents, United Nations, uh, Prime, uh, various uh, academic association, journals and so on. Uh, so that is an opportunity to engage uh, with some of the materials that students are producing and also that some of our authors are producing out of uh, critical perspectives. And they have very clear instructions as to uh, how to, to utilize that, to contribute, make a contribution to societally engaged international business, to uh, international business that actually improves uh, outcomes for uh, society and the planet. And here I will stop. Thank you so much, Rudolph. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, very much appreciate your insight on that. And to our next speaker now, Dr. Michael.
Well, thank you, David and Amit. Uh, greetings to all from Sacramento, California. Uh, Uh, and so when I see chat messages come, I think that's a message for me. So I'll lay off that. Uh, greetings from Sacramento, California. It's an honor to be part of the Research Spotlight a collaboration between the Centers for International Business at Michigan State and Texas a and um, I am the editor-in-chief for the Journal of International Education and Business, and that's International Education and Business. It does cover international business, but it also extends beyond that. And I'll talk to that in a moment. The journal was founded by doctors Joanna Crossman and Sarbari Bordia uh, out of uh, Australia. Uh, both of them at that time were at the University of uh, South Australia. And, uh, you know, they set this journal up. It started off as a single volume, single issue journal and they edited it right up till 2021 uh, built a very robust reviewer base uh, a, a pipeline of articles which were truly international and then dr mike slotkin at florida institute of technology and i took it over as co-editors and since april of 2023 uh, i have been the editor-in-chief for uh, the the journal uh, you know the research agenda that Doctors uh, Crossman and Bardia set up for the journal uh, resonates in today as well. It, even though it is in 2008, it resonates even today. The agenda was essentially, you know, at the heart of it, international education and business is still scholarship about teaching and learning. And with the added aspect and dimension that it's about teaching and learning within an international context. And so within their research agenda, commercialization of the internationalization of uh, education and business was an aspect. Uh, cultural identity and cross-cultural encounters through pedagogical innovations. Uh, they also very early talked about sustainability, including spiritual education in secular and culturally diverse business schools. You know, that agenda, if you look at uh, a recent 2022 article by Jibs, uh, which is based off the survey by uh, AIB and AACSB, uh, shows that international business education or international education and business uh, continues to be fairly vibrant internationally. The expectation is we're going to have around 10 million students by 2030, uh, you know, engaging international education and business. And you know, from that perspective, the way international education and business, our perspective, it aligns with that survey, which shows that at one level, it is about international business. So it's about international business education, but it is also about the infusion of international edu uh, business education within mainstream educational uh, disciplines like accounting, finance, management, and so on. Jibs, another article in 2016 by Scott Snell, well, Morris, Scott Snell and colleagues uh, talked about, you know, when you think about international business education, it is about human capital development. Uh, uh, Brian Becker's work, which was uh, about human capital development, that's at the heart of what we do in international education and business. Uh, the teaching journal, uh, uh, well, the critical uh, perspectives on international business. Uh, that journal had an interesting article, 2016, which talked about these different elements that Crossman and Borgia had int introduced, and taking a systems perspective when we think about educating uh, education in an international business perspective. The teaching journal, the the uh, the journal for teaching in international business, also in Similarly, you know, these dimensions or these agenda items are reflected in, the, in that journal too, where it talks about in Dealman's 2022 article about students learning and experiences to be tied with innovative international teaching pedagogy. And then their 2021 article by Liu and colleagues, which talks about the integration of technology, uh, both virtual reality and artificial intelligence with Dr. Wu also alluded to in her presentation. So, you know, my critical perspective about international business education, it's taken me some time to think about it, has been, I think we're thinking about, you know, like a multiverse, two different worlds. One's the world that comes out from countries where you have established higher education institutions, countries where business education has a tradition, they're well on their way, 
And so the way we understand uh, business education and research and teaching is mostly reflected in those countries. And then there's the second world of countries which are trying to get on board and countries that have in the recent past adopted and taken on and engaged those international education uh, methodologies, the research that we see there. And therefore, if you look at the left column here, I think there's a body of knowledge that exists. And that body of knowledge is reflective of seminal research that helps us understand basically teaching and learning scholarship, the learning conditions in which uh, education is undertaken, the institutional uh, mechanisms that frame the context in which it happens. With the added element for international business is the cross-cultural dimension. Uh, I mean, straight away, Hofstede's dimensions weigh in, and that's seminal. But there's also the practice and possibly accreditation standards that influence some of it, not purely research, is the expectation of a global mindset in business schools. Uh, instructional methods, uh, you know, even before the, the post, uh, before COVID, instructional methods had been uh, the works of Arbog, for example, uh, Salas, for example, have explored hybrid instructional methods where you're trying to find the best of both worlds between face-to-face -face and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and online uh, training. Uh, Dr. Wu talked about experiential learning. Uh, you know, those are methods that have, uh, that have, those are seminal approaches that have helped us understand teaching and learning scholarship, but which we also see now being extended to uh, within the international business education, or in our case, the international education of business. Uh, you know, if you look at the right column, those are examples of some articles that we've published recently, uh, just at the institutional level, uh, university to university, so between US and Peru, but also within, uh, between agencies, so government agencies and uh, funding agencies, so foundations uh, on supply chain management, which was uh, a whole study and this was not focused on students, the, the way we traditionally understand students, but this was focused on faculty development, which is another additional dimension to understanding international education and business. Uh, another one out of Saudi Arabia, which is about business and university partnerships. And these partnerships were framed within their own local, uh, not local, well, for them it's local, but for us it's international Mutkan systems, which was basically a university business partnership. Uh, in India, you know, taking up experiential learning, the work of COBE's uh, four C's model and applying it to uh, rural and agricultural management courses and institutions and program development. And this one looked at how do you bring student voices in for developing those programs. And then out of Brazil, uh, we had interdisciplinary research that got recently published about uh, service engineering methodologies along with project-based learning. And so I think as I, you know, as I kept thinking about this, I try to come up with a two by two. And if you think, if you look at it, the first quadrant is really the established research that we see coming out of countries that have established higher education institutions, business programs, and, you know, vibrant research programs there. And so in addition to that, I would add the aspect of study abroad, which is something that's in, in has initially been initiated in those locations, and we're seeing it grow internationally. Quadrant two is what we are seeing published, for example, the supply chain article that I talked about, where scholars internationally are finding ways to integrate into the seminal research. And that's usually a challenge with international scholarship. Uh, international scholars often have to figure out, and, and we help them out when, during the review process. I think that's one of the perspectives I've taken here as, a, as an editor, is that we're also trying to build our community of scholars internationally. So our peer review process is also part partly educational. So helping them integrate their local internet, their international experiences, which is local for them within seminal research. And then the second piece is about emerging practices. And so in this example, I talk about the Matganic practice from Saudi Arabia, the rural management practices from India, uh, the service engineering interdisciplinary uh, uh, teaching methodologies and research that, that's coming out of Brazil. So those emergent practices that are coming in. What's very rare is the fourth quadrant, research coming out from international locations that truly, uh, at least for our journal, I'm sure uh, your journals are actually capturing some of that, uh, that actually add to the seminal research that uh, exists in the teaching and learning scholarship. The other side, and uh, the other side, and I'm going to move faster through the remaining slides. Uh, the other side to this, when you think about the critical perspective, is methodological rigor. I think this is another example where the world has 
demonstrated that it is flat again. Uh, and specifically on the methodologies that we've seen coming out from different international locations, both qualitative and quantitative, where scholars at the qualitative level have, have used action research methodologies to, to transform their own lived experiences, either whether they're trying to get accreditation, bring about change, or they're actually introducing new practices, but they use that to introduce qualitative research uh, for to the journal. Uh, the other is quantitative research. I mean, international scholars trying to develop their own instruments, show goodness of fit indices, uh, you know, do uh, confirmatory, exploratory factor analyses, uh, introduce mediating and moderating analysis, network, uh, neural network analysis. We're seeing those emerge internationally too. Most of them, in fact, all of them, I don't think I've published a single longitudinal study, uh, but all of it is cross-sectional data. And then we're also seeing a number of case study-based researchers that are coming, including case studies for teaching methodologies. And then, of course, very rare, and again, I don't think I've seen a single article in JIB, which is a conceptual piece, that's a conceptual article, uh, meta-analysis and reviews. And then the second, the other column on the right-hand side here is about contributions, and I think that's a big piece here. Uh, one of the challenges internationally is understanding what you're, being able to articulate and claim the contribution of your research to the to within the seminal research, I mean, you know, I'm not looking for uh, international research that fundamentally transforms or changes seminal research. But if you can at least articulate the implications for research, for seminal research based on what your findings are or what your qualitative or, or quantitative findings are, uh, connections to sustainable SDGs. That's uh, another place where contributions are emerging interdisciplinary research, like the examples that I gave. And then we've had research that's been published on business doctoral degrees among underrepresented minorities, new neurodiversity among faculty. So development op developmental opportunities for neurodiverse faculty, uh, corporate governance based on a stakeholder and shareholder model. And you know all of these themes that I've just called out, they actually continue to show the relevance of the research agenda that Crossman and Borgia started off and that Mike Slotkin has also been involved with his work on uh, study abroad, which is uh, which the JIB survey actually identified as a pretty rigorous and a pretty vibrant approach in international business, uh, in methodologies for teaching international education and business. Artificial intelligence is something that we're trying to figure out. We have actually an, an ongoing special issue. It closed. We have editors working on it, on generative AI for sustainable business education. And then the other piece was about best teaching practices. And here, again, you know, as much as we've seen the global landscape has changed extensively, yet we see, you know, while multilateral agreements may not be, uh, you know, the 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 most visible aspect of global business, we still see uh, regional. We see bilateral. We see preferential trade agreements. And we also see ASCSB's accreditation expectation for a global mindset. And all of these drive the relevance and importance for international business education. The one aspect that I would highlight in, in international teaching best practices is the work of, and I attribute it to the co-editor that I had, Mike Slotkin, who's, you know, who introduced also a, uh, a special issue on study abroad, which we are about to close. And hopefully that would be the second, uh, uh, second issue for our 2025, and that's a big piece. A study abroad, international uh, connections, uh, helping students have immersive experiences is a, is a big piece in the teaching methodology, uh, which extends beyond the taken for the seminal teaching methodologies, which is part of your teaching and learning scholarship. Even in study abroad, we're seeing different flavors. We're seeing uh, you know, online flavors of study abroad. We're seeing virtual study abroads. We're seeing short-term study abroads. Uh, methodologies that are coming in. And then on the, on the right side is the COIL methodology, which is that collaborative online learning methodology that uses online methodologies for uh, imparting education, uh, both to traditional students and even executive students through continuing education. Uh, the other piece, again, is about when you think about education and business, the types of practices are derived from the traditional disciplines, which is management, accounting, finance. We've seen an increase in, in publications coming in from entrepreneurship uh, that have found ways to present uh, different ways to understand international 
and cross-cultural uh, theories. So for example, Hofstede's met notion of collectivism when our international scholars bring it, they think, in, and especially in entrepreneurship, they're talking about it in terms of you know, family support. They're talking about joint families and they're bringing that notion in to exploring collectivism and its implications for uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship. We're seeing structured pedagogies that are being talked about. Uh, gamification, uh, simulations are coming in. Uh, design thinking methodologies in curriculum design and program design, and then the use of generative artificial intelligence. A recent paper actually finds that generative AI is of use as long as it does not erode uh, critical thinking skills of students. So it doesn't take away from that. It also is useful where it's able to, you know, uh, to minimize the biases that the generative AI has within their own learned machine language systems. Uh, and then again, it's uh, best teaching practices are driven by AACSB ex expectations. And I keep m mentioning this global entrepreneurship, mo uh, global mindset model, and the expectation that traditional students, but also executive level students will, will be able to uh, gain from that. Uh, and I'll take maybe 60 seconds more. In terms of publishing for JIB, I think we have more flexibility. The fact that we are international education and business, I think following submission guidelines is key. And like I said, it's an educational process. And just because authors don't follow it, you know, using the different features of Scholar One, like Unsubmit, we help them and educate them in trying to uh, understand both the submission process, the expectations, uh, scope guidelines, ethical guidelines, and then also about understanding what uh, peer-reviewed scientific research is. The one piece that I would highlight is that, you know, research is hard, and I've been there, had papers rejected, and then if you repurpose papers from mainstream business, uh, try to, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to modify the conceptual background, and you'd have to draw from business, education research to make your paper fit in within the scope of the journal. The one pitch I'd make for JIEB is that if you do submit to us and it does clear the editorial desk review, uh, we try our best to give you at least two reviewers feedback. We have a strong, again, like I said, Crossman and Borgia have built a, a nice reviewer database. We have a community of reviewers. For those who review for us, the advantages are we're looking at growing them, growing them into editorial positions, uh, into editorial board member positions. And finally, we do try to give decisions as soon as possible, for sure, definitely by the R3 level. Uh, with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you for your time. And again, uh, once again, thank you for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's been an honor. Excellent. That was that was a wonderful presentation. So I've got a number of questions that have come to me directly and some that were, were in the chat. So uh, the first one is going to be a general one that I'd like each of the editors to speak to briefly. Um, and that question is, if you could give us a little bit of insight into how papers are handled at your journal, who chooses the reviewers, are the AEs aware of the authors or the authorship or is the authorship blind to them? Um, and how many reviewers are in, in, in Boniface, you just spoke to how many reviewers at your journal, but if you could just give us a, a brief synopsis of each, we're going to go in the same order for this question. So we'll start with Ellie. So our journal, um, JTIB is a journal that has a long history. We started publishing in 1989. Um, so we are um, actually quite um, similar to the traditional academic uh, peer review, double-blinded review process. So when you submit a journal through um, Scholar One manuscript systems that will have the editors starting to allocate it to specific AEs and then to, uh, finding reviewers. Um, so usually you will receive a first decisions whether this paper will go to reviewers or whether this will be rejected or on submit or reject and resubmit. We have seen a lot more reject and resubmit recently just because um, I think similar to Dr. Michaels mentioned that some authors kind of having difficulty navigating what is what is the fit, right? What is, how can I position my paper better for the journal? So rather than just saying, hey, we reject you because we, we don't see quite fit, we try to kind of advocate in terms of how can you position a little bit better? Um, so we see a little bit more of that in terms of reject and submit, but once the, the editor would decide, okay, this is a good fit, um, then we'll send it to a reviewer, it's a double, 
blind peer review. We have two reviewer reports and usually that will take a little bit more longer time. Um, um, it, it's a little bit, I would say, uh, harder to find reviewers for teaching education journals, um, but we tried our best um, to find the reviewers and then go through the editor decisions. Um, usually I see um, two rounds or three rounds of decisions of revisions to the final publications. Um, usually when we when the journal come back at editors, we're pretty fast with editor decisions and the longer period usually is the, the time with the reviewer. Mm -hmm. Okay, David, so you want me to jump in here? Please, please yeah, good. I had so, trouble turning my audio back on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, so uh, CPOIB, Critical Perspectives on International Business, is again a traditional journal. We have uh, no reviewing editor door, so it, everything goes directly to the editors in chief in the first instance. That's myself uh, here at Durham or uh, Mehdi Buseba at, at Glasgow. He has probably more of a post-colonial slant to anything, so if he detects that, he will uh, take ownership of the paper. Everything else is most likely um, uh, yeah, equally distributed or distributed such that uh, we are vote volunteering and voting uh, to follow uh, particular papers. Uh, then we are sending it out either we are handling ourselves, right? Or we send it out to associate editors. Those uh, are listed on the on the page and on the web page. Uh, it's making real sense for any author to look at the associate editors because you know there are some people from marketing, there are some people from uh, institutional uh, theory background, there are some people who are in the so, uh, sustainable business more involved than others. So uh, it's very likely, and unfortunately, that is not always considered. Uh, some authors are su submitting and, and uh, you know, not really looking at the audit trail of uh, previous papers that have been uh, coming up uh, in the journal by authors who are associate editors or otherwise. So a real a strong incentive or in encouragement, a deliberate encouragement for everybody uh, follow the audit trail of what people on the editorial publish uh, editorial board have published and which conversation they have then, because of course we are published elsewhere too, but uh, which conversation have they taken into CPOIB, right? Because there's, as indicated in my introductory slide, where I thought what's the difference between on IB and in IB, I think uh, similarly there are a couple of viewpoints by previous editors who discuss certain phenomena which they think uh, rightfully uh, in the domain of, of CPOIB and, and if you're not aware of what we understand with uh, critical international business, then unfortunately you cannot frame your paper <laughs> sufficiently. So that's really quite important. Uh, another thing, because uh, Bonifa, Michael was, was indicating COPE, uh, you're suffering similarly, seemingly from the same publisher, right? Emerald is very big on COPE. Why? Because they don't want to fall into the uh, same um, problems that uh, Elsevier is having, right? Elsevier has uh, up and down, <laughs> very commercialized their businesses. And uh, I briefly browsed the attendees, so it seems there is no publisher present. So I will speak a little bit more freely. And, and Elsevier has gone into the bad waters in many, many respects with some of the journals because they are kind of keen to get more and more papers out. There are even uh, some mainstream journals, um, I will not name it now, which are, you know, have increased from the previous editor to the newest editor by hundredfolds uh, of, 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 of papers. So whenever there is a big increase in the numbers, that is also not very good. So uh, and, and has impact on the rankings and otherwise. So the issue is that some publishers are there by very, very keen to not fall into the into the pit such as Elsevier. Emerald is doing that. COPE, the uh, uh, what is it, the Consortium of Publishing Ethics, has a particular uh, set of rules and guidelines. And some of the publishers, uh, Emerald is one of those, are implementing that more rigorously or blindly, I should say, without intelligence. That's what I mean. Uh, than than the editors would would do, right? So I am sometimes receiving papers from people whose quality I can at face value already evaluate very quickly. And if then, uh, for instance, the, the authors are making recommendations in the system, then my hands are more tight than if they tell me at the conference, oh, there are these, 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 these possible reviewers. So that's also something to consider. It's easier to deal with that in practical terms than if you kind of in, inform uh, the the publishing house uh, via the system because then uh, you can only have one out of three and, and there are all kinds of 
rules which making uh, which are making the selection of reviews increasingly difficult so my recommendation on a very practical level is if you have uh, if you bump into an editor an ed associate editor and you can warm their heart you find their interest and usually that speaks uh, to itself and we have a conversation about this and then we can uh, better navigate the paper around people who might perhaps not positively be dis predisposed to help your paper along, but sort of more negatively. And that's that's uh, the, the key point I, I wish to make is we have the editorial agenda. As Lepak, a former EMJ, our, I think uh, editor was saying, help uh, the idea to, to flourish, right? So help a paper out. That's what we try to do. And so again, for us, uh, Journal of International Education and Business, we are published by Emerald. And Emerald, like you said, uh, Dr. Uh, Senkovich, it's pretty strong about uh, COPE ethics and following guidelines. Uh, recently, just for the first time yesterday, I noticed we were being asked to also, when we accept a paper in, when we triage a paper in, we're being asked to mark whether there are any human subject protocols that need to be maintained and consent has been taken. So, uh, you know, I have a managing editor at this time and the managing editor really takes care of that first step. I think that entry point is very key. It's key for two reasons. One is uh, for sure getting rid of a paper, but then also finding those, you know, the, 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 the gems that have to be, have to be created. And so we use the unsubmit option quite often there. If we think a paper seems to be about higher education, but there may be business education elements, we'll unsubmit, I'll unsubmit, and then I'll have them, you know, if they feel like resubmitting and come back to us with that information. But once it's in the system, once it clears the desk, then all of them go through blind peer review. And at this time, I don't have associate editors. Uh, we've had associate editors in the past, uh, till about a year back, we had about three associate editors. Uh, two from New Zealand, one from Australia. Uh, earlier, we had co two co-editors. We would sh share the workload at that time. Right now, I'm the one. Tri uh, tri so all, once the paper's triaged to me, I take care of all the reviewer assignments, and it is all blind. Uh, we do, I do as an editor, try to synthesize. It's what I went through when I was an author, having, you know, when I was going through the grind, I had some great editors from a number of journals who synthesized reviewers' comments, helped me focus on what needs to be done, what, you know, if, if, an, if a reviewer says, uh, find new data, that may not be, you know, may not be something that's really helpful to a, a an author. And so I'll, I'll try to synthesize that feedback for them. I also, our reviewers are international. Uh, they may have different training from our training in terms of qualitative and quantitative methods. And so sometimes I have to add on to what the reviewers say. And so often, not often, but there are times where my decisions are quite different from what uh, the reviewers will recommend. Or if the reviewer's recommendations are something that I, I may go and seek out more reviewers. And so it does prolong the review process but it is all well intended to help grow our scholarship community internationally and to get that get their voice on the at the table to have them have an opportunity at the table. So I think a, a scholar one's pretty useful. I try to use the different features, the revise and resubmit features, uh, the unsubmit features, the audit trail to keep track and help authors succeed. But I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'd like to go now to some of the chat um, questions. So I'll go to the first one. Should good up to date or should good up to date case studies be the heart of IB education, given the complexity and nuances of IB settings faced by MNCs, for example? If so, how can we better incentivize scholars to develop fresh case studies for IB teaching? Who would like to take that one? Happy to go on this one, Matt. Hello, nice to see you in the in the in the room in the virtual room. So I think uh, should the should question I will not respond to because uh, I think it really depends. I think there has been a, a kind of a globalization of case study teaching, and I do believe in some contexts it does not work as well. And I noticed, for instance, that in in the UK context, uh, in the UK master student uh, context, for instance, I'm increasingly having hesitations as to the way in which that works, right, uh, with case studies. But in terms of incentivization, I think that uh, I can perhaps more uh, competently respond to. I think uh, CPIB does offer a great 
uh, uh, encouragement, incentive, right? We are listed as a two-star. Uh, if you get the case study in there, uh, which is of course slightly different, has in a slightly different format from if you otherwise would would go for uh, Harvard case study or you know ECCH uh, clearinghouse or or INSEAD or whatever, right? So these these other case um, study uh, opportunities, they don't give you any. Well, they give you of course a, a market, right? If you're good. <laughs> A case study promoter, then you can uh, and 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 use that uh, worldwide in teaching. Then of course that gives you a financial advantage, but not necessarily regarding the kudos on your CV. So we would actually uh, encourage that, and you would get incentive. I think that's uh, a, a clear case where where CPIB could win. So far, I have not been able to communicate that very uh, loudly and and strongly. So far, not many people have been biting the apple. You know, uh, Dr. Wu, if you, go ahead, please. Oh, okay. So I think uh, case study research, uh, we are open to case study research, uh, but we are looking for case study research that sh demonstrates validity and reliability in the way that it is being designed. Uh, and so when scholars bring in case study research, uh, it's a challenge using case study to either showcase a teaching method or using case study to show a research finding. And both of them have different, so there's a teaching case study, there's research case studies. So I think it's, for me, it's more fundamentally important. The methodology is important for research. If your methodology is flawed, there's nothing much we can do with it. If the methodology is sound and valid and reliable, we can help, and I, we do. Our reviewers do. Our reviewers provide, and they've slowly been getting into that. They'll provide examples, their references they'll provide to help the authors. And so we're open to that. I'm not sure what up-to-date case studies means or fresh case studies mean. For me, it's still social, psychological. It's about teaching and learning, uh, and those matter. But we discover, so study abroad, You know, we discovered recently from Canada a paper which was about study missions. So executive MBA students were going on trade missions and somebody thought of, you know, that's an immersive educational experience and they've submitted a paper. I think we are up to, we are open to those no, novel insights of maybe practices that have been existing for a while and bringing those to the table, uh, bringing those to the, the, the review desk. And so that's, that's my perspective, I'll stop there. To, to echo Dr. Michael's um, point, I think um, JTIP, we have not published as many case study. Um, we are open to, but I would say it's not the, the number one focus of the journal. I, I think it's, but we do publish articles related to case studies. I think the, the, the key difference is, are you submitting this as a teaching resources or are you submitting this as a pedagogical discussion? Um, so we have published papers that are willing to utilize case study in a different way. It's where a special format of case study. So those are providing insights in, in terms of pedagogical improvements. Um, I, I also completely agree in terms of um, showcase the, the validity, right? Um, what is the learning effectiveness outcomes associated with the, the case study? I think those are quite important um, to, to consider. And in terms of Encourage, I, I do believe case studies are such a invaluable resources for teaching international business. Um, actually, when um, I had a chance to participate in IIB's teaching education SIG, one of their initiative is to develop small mini case studies. Not only there are short pieces that, that uh, educators can use very easily, but also it's a case study that will invite multiple professors from different different countries to give a different point of view on the same case studies. And I think that's a great initiative to make case studies a more popular, uh, more, more accessible way for educators to utilize in their teaching education. Excellent, thank you. So this is gonna be a real quick question. Um, the question is on design thinking. The um, participant said, um, are there calls for papers on design thinking at your at your outlets? And I would just simply ask you to expand upon your openness to design thinking or work on design thinking. So if we can, uh, I'm actually going to start with Boniface and then go to Ella and then Rudolph, simply because that's how you're organized on my screen. Thank you. Uh, that's a, that's an interesting question. We've had one paper on design thinking uh, on uh, program design and curriculum development. 
uh, we're open to special issues. I think uh, Emerald closed the special issue call. Uh, it was open for quite a while, for nearly a year. But we're open to special issues. We'd be open to a special issue on this design thinking, but its application needs to be in relation to uh, international education in business. Uh, it's, as, it's as simple as that, yeah. Similarly, I <laughs> did echo, um, we're open to the different uh, different thinking, different philosophy. We At one point, we had one paper in design thinking. We tried to walk through with the authors, but eventually, uh, unfortunately, we have to, at the end, we have to reject because it's just not related to IB teaching. Um, it's just too far distance um, that could be considered within the scope of the journal. So we are open to design thinking. As a matter of fact, one of the, my, um, I know there's a lot of points in my slides, but one of the point is we, we try to think about in terms of at a higher curriculum level, right? What What is the digitalizations of of higher education have implications, especially for IP programs. If we are starting to see a lot of online IP programs, but then we also, we know that IB students, you really need that immersive experiences. How can we effectively deliver uh, transformative learning through online? And when we design a program at a program level, uh, what components needs to be some sort of more, have a little more in-person flavor, right? Um, to have a good online program for international business. Um, so we are open to this kind of discussion, this kind of paper, as long as it's tied to international business as a field, and also as long as it's tied to the education and teaching of international business. Excellent. Rudolph? Yeah, I think I respond perhaps more generally. We have not had a paper on design thinking. We have no special issue on design thinking. But generally, uh, the way that works with special issues, uh, basically in the community, somebody identified a, a gap uh, or an under-researched topic, uh, an area. So if there is a number of people who come together and provide a solid uh, call for papers, that is something that needs to be developed usually in, in coordination with uh, more senior colleagues, also perhaps with people who are, in our case, if people are not uh, familiar with the journal, then what we would do, we give a supervising editor to sort of navigate the, the, the road into the journal a little bit more easier. And usually the, the call for paper proposal is then looked at by the editors in chief together with the associate editors. When, when either of us, uh, the two editors in chief is totally excited, we ignore the associate editors, but when we are not sure, then we are asking the associate editors. That's how it works in our case. Well, it is, that's great insight. Um, I, May I, I just add one, one more point, sir? Please. Is that the, the proposers of the special issue, uh, their track record in publishing matters. So, uh, you know, for us to accept a special issue and you're planning to do one so in design thinking, uh, do constitute a valid a group of uh, scholars. So. Nice point, nice point. Um, I'm gonna modify the next question. The next question um, in the chat is how do I, is a, is a young new scholar, how do I sort of sign up to be a reviewer? My guess is you're gonna tell us, go into the review system and, and sign up as a reviewer. My, my bigger question would be though, is how can they become selected to be a reviewer? Um, so if they've placed themselves within your system, you've got a lot of people in your system. How can they start gaining experience um, in reviewing it, it, your specific journals? We'll go in the reverse order. So I'll start with Rudolph, then go to Ella, and then go to Boniface. Okay, so for me or for our journal, this is actually quite simple. The associate, uh, the editors in chief, either you make contact with the editors in chief. Um, uh, and if you send me an email and ask, uh, then I will send you a um, response. If you're not known to me, if never engaged with you around the conference, and that goes with all the other associate editors too, then what usually we do, we send out, I certainly do that, I send out an invite pack, right? What the invite pack includes is basically, I've been teaching uh, reviewing for probably 10 years now uh, at the time when nobody was even writing about this. And I use some of my slides there, some of my material and give uh, a, a few papers to look at. Uh, there is now in chips, there is an editorial, there is something which I found very useful in MOR uh, under Ari Lewin. Uh, there are also very good books on how to get published and how to be a good reviewer. And so I would give a selected sort of set of instructions to you 
Uh, and uh, in the first instance, if I don't know you, then what I would do, I add you as a third reviewer. You're, usually we work with two reviewers uh, who we sort of have uh, confidence about uh, doing uh, professional reviews. And then in the first instance, I might add you as a third reviewer. And if you sort of uh, don't fail the test, so to speak, then you will uh, probably to the de detriment of your own uh, time scheduling, will receive more and more reviews than perhaps you would want to be involved in. But please send an email. I'm happy to to engage you very very shortly. Ellen. So the way we typically select reviewer is the the first tier, not tier, like the the, the first cohort that we are maybe go to is uh, we see whether people have published, right? Whether people have published pre previously in our journal or a journal that's closely related because that usually shows some um, knowledge in terms of publishing teacher educational journals and also knowledge in terms of the scope and aim of the journal. Um, and then usually we will also go through databases to see, to identify authors that have similar publications and similar expertise. Sometimes Google scholars will be very helpful to identify, again, additional authors that have um, similar expertise. Um, for young authors who want to become reviewers, we actually talk about this. We're going to add in a link on our um, journal page for reviewers who uh, who would like to participate in the review assistant, and then we will collectively collect those information. But for right now, um, similarly, you can just email me or email our um, editorial team um, accounts, JTIP dot editors at gmail.com that we will reach out to you. Um, typically we add new reviewers through the system, which will send you a request for review, which will give the information about abstract of the of the paper. So very similar. Um, then we can start with the reviewing process. Excellent. And I echo uh, both Dr. Wu and Dr. Sinkovich's uh, perspective for both for the review process and for young reviewers. Uh, we have Scholar One. It's pretty effective. As long as uh, authors have entered information, they have indicated a willingness, which is a big one for us, indicating a willingness to review. And you know, the more papers you're willing to review, the better for us and for your own development too. Uh, I think being thoughtful about your ketones that you put in, and this is especially also for uh, new, uh, new scholars, you know, be thoughtful about the words that you want to use. We are into education. Though we are related to mainstream disciplinary business, we are mostly, into, we are fully focused on education and international aspects of it. So use keywords that we can then match to kind of, kind of work that we will get, and that helps. The other is update your ORCID uh, IDs. If you have ORCID work that's been published and, uh, you know, keep that updated so that we, you know, we could go and find uh, reviewers from there. Uh, if you're looking to review for the Journal of International Education and Business, I'm happy. I'm looking always for reviewers. Shoot me an email. Uh, we'll invite you in, and then you need to complete the form, put in some thoughtful keywords, and we, you for sure you'll hear back from us within a week, if not earlier, to review papers. We have a lot of papers lined there to review, so always welcome. Can I add uh, one one point on this, uh, David, if you don't mind? I think uh, the CVs also, I noticed that in the UK, CVs are also, the way you structure and organize your CV, particularly for, for junior researchers, are also changing. And uh, increasingly, uh, because in the past there have been some uh, situations where people are saying, oh, I'm reviewing for this and for that. So increasingly in the UK, I noticed that people uh, put an emphasis on uh, evidence uh, of reviewing activity and one way to be evi to evidence uh, what you are reviewing is basically to connect uh, A on ORCID but B also on this uh, web of science uh, review acknowledgement system which is uh, very easy once you receive uh, thank you for your review email then you just forward it on to the address which is I think reviews at webofscience.com or something like that and uh, that gives you, a, you know, a, 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 a tick box or a notification that you have reviews for this journal. Nothing more, but that is enough for some uh, people who hire you into a position to credibly demonstrate that you have been uh, reviewing, just uh, as an add-on. Excellent, excellent. So what I'm going to ask now is that all three panelists keep their mics open because we are going to move to a lightning round with, with questions. Um, and so these will be very, very short answers. Uh, we are going to start with Ella, and then go to Rudolph, and then go to Boniface. So Ella, Rudolph, Boniface, here's the first question. 
Are there any areas that you've seen so much work in that it's difficult to make a contribution? Uh, study abroad. Well, um, to me, traditional study abroad, I would say. Market orientation. Entrepreneurship. We're getting lots of papers on that. Excellent. Next question. Are there any sensitive topics or issues that should be avoided? Um, I would say this is have to be case by case, but some of the articles are so specific within one specific area, regions, or countries, it's very hard to see implications for other part. And I think that could get into uh, just two specific topics. So for CPOIB, we live and breathe uh, the topics which are too sensitive for others. So we are keen to get all of this. Uh, and of course, if you, from the outset, if it is clear that there is an interesting contribution, then of course we will help you to avoid those reviewers who would certainly think that you steer up the sensitivities. Uh, I can't think of any topic that's controversial for us, but I would say intent. So try to be, especially because English may be not the first language, the choice of words may matter. And we recently had a paper on DEI where the choice of words while describing uh, group work was problematic. And I don't, and so, you know, just keeping that in mind that important topics which are value based, uh, respectfully deal with those topics when you bring them in, especially Excellent. if you bring those groups. Yeah. Excellent. Next question um, Is what is your opinion on? Generative AI for editing my work. Um, we are currently basically follows the publishers, um, publisher guidelines in terms of um, evaluating the AI components in the work. I think in general, um, for improving writing, um, to the point doesn't really reflect the core essence of your write of, of your paper should um, be okay, but that's just follow the current guidelines. But again, these things change so fast. Um, I think all the journals try to figure out what is the appropriate guidelines for that. Um, but you general would just follow through our publishers' guidelines for um getting for involving the AI um component. So uh, people who read AI generated text are getting extremely annoyed, and it's I mean it, the problem is it's it's detected not so quickly as real poor quality work. It it's you know it takes more time, but uh, I guess uh, I would say from my perspective, you make an enemy for life if somebody detects that you are using generative AI for writing stuff, right? Because you're wasting really everybody's time. But as Ellie was uh, El was indicating, yes, uh, you know go ahead and improve your English, right? Um, so at, at Emerald, we actually have authors declare that they have not used generative AI or the, and that the work is all original. So uh, Emerald's not open to generative AI. I think about scholarship, if authors use generative AI as part, part of their methodology to arrive at brainstorming, arriving at some perspectives. I did something on arbitration where we try to assess neutrality of students' simulation about arbitration. So we used AI to see, based on student introductions, would that be how neutral was the student as an arbitrator? But using it for language to script your manuscript, I think at this level is, uh, I don't, I don't think it fits the the mission and and uh, and the values of the traditions that we we follow here in scientific in peer reviewed scientific research. That's my. Uh, stage at in the 21st century in 2024. I don't know whether that's going to change, but values should endure. So I, let's see. Excellent. Next question. Are you taking any specific actions to support early career researchers? Yes, we are going to, we're in the planning of uh, develop educational content, for example, for reviewers. Uh, we have seen that my experience going to IB conferences when or, um, author comes up to me is usually they don't understand journal uh, publishing for teaching and learning. Uh, they have a lot of good ideas, a lot of good projects and classes. They never thought about what is the process of publishing, specifically scholarship publishing for that. So we are going to um, create more of educational content for reviewing and for publishing, for writing papers specifically for um, for research in teaching and learning. And that um, 
if especially like younger um authors, researchers who are not familiar with publishing in teaching and learning, then we do encourage you to um start with, with your become a reviewer and get trained and get um discussion with the editors through the reviewing process and kind of learn what is what is the key insights that other reviewers will see and the key key points that editors will see. Yeah, so I, I follow on here uh, the reviewer uh, hand-holding process, as I mentioned, you know, being reviewer three, who largely in the first round as a as an early career PhD student, uh, I would ignore mostly the comments, but you would see all the other comments, right? So that is the first thing. But more importantly, of course, we have paper development workshops. And uh, recently, I am now, for instance, involved in the European International Business Academy as a pre-conference workshop with uh, quite seminal uh, players, Global Strategy Journal, GIPS, uh, and and uh, what is a psychology journal and 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 some something else where we are doing what is called uh, an idea development workshop. I'm quite happy of that because it's sort of an idea that I had um, uh, over over many years how to develop actually a good idea that also can be followed through. Because sometimes when you get a paper through a PDW, a paper development workshop. Well, I'm as, as a commentator sometimes, you know, in a challenging position. I would never have, for instance, it could it could be right. I would perhaps never had supported the idea in the first place because it can't work out, right? This is, for instance, but what do you then do? Which feedback do you give to a young, uh, esteemed, or aspiring PhD student who comes out of a particular school of thought and has invested uh, years and years of energy? You know, you want to help them to get it published somewhere. But perhaps it is not possible, you know, with methodological and theoretical underpinnings to really publish it in the in the top outputs. So I think one step earlier, and that's what we are now trying to do, is to catch uh, how do you produce a good career, a uh, good, good idea that can help you in creating your own career. And so that's what we are doing as well, for instance, now. And uh, I would hope that I can replicate this model if it is successful also in the africa chapter that's the next thing that i'm I'm thinking of or in the digitalization seek where i'm also uh involved uh next to giles Danaraj and other colleagues uh, yeah i think we're trying to build a journal right now we're still growing trying to grow the journal next year we're gonna we're moving to four issues so I think that I would take this as a do list, a do list item for me from your question, something to think about, about, you know, the kind of workshops that you're talking about, the instructables that you're talking about, both the panelists we're talking about, uh, trying to offer that for reviewers. For now, uh, for, uh, for uh, newer authors, uh, for now, I would say international authors for whom English is not a first language, those who are trying to publish, and fresh new authors would get the same treatment. We would be sensitive, we would be responsive to developing their peer-reviewed research skills. I'd say, I'd give one advice I would give them is pay attention to your cover letter. Let us know you're an early scholar because often the cover letter is not used strategically in trying to communicate with the editors. That's possible. Yeah, so that's what I'd, I'd say. I, you know, we're very open to helping them just as I did when I was an early scholar. Well, we would love to do that. And uh, that's the plan. I'll take this as a do item. And thank you both for bringing this to, you know, to, our, to us. Well, thank you so much. We are running out of time here. I want to thank our panelists so much for just a absolutely insightful set of presentations. For our um, participants, I will say that this will be a, a recording that will go on our Center for International Business Studies site here at Texas A&M University, and you'll also get an email following up. I would like to big, give a, a shout out to Amit Kroja, my um, co-host of this event, and to Katie Lane, the director of the Center for International Business Studies at Texas A&M University. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amit for final words. You're muted, Amit. <laughs> Amit, you're still muted. <laughs> All right, I should learn this after five years, right? So I was just saying, it's always a pleasure to uh, work with to work with David Griffith. Always a pleasure. He's been a great co-host for the past uh, thirteen uh, research spotlights. We just completed the fifteenth, and the feedback that we get uh, from our uh, participants, from our panelists. 
have always been great and we're happy to continue to do this. And it's a pleasure to work with David moving forward. Um, certainly, uh, I would like to thank Ali, Rudolph and Boniface for joining us today and for sharing useful insights and tips on IB education and teaching. Uh, our participants have asked really great questions. Thank you for joining us for this interesting panel and for these questions. And of course, I would like to use this opportunity to thank our teams at MSU uh, who helped us promote the, the uh, research spotlight, this research spotlight event and um, our colleagues at Texas A&M Cyber, uh, in particular, Katie and her team. And we're looking forward to seeing you again in one of our research spotlight webinars in the future. Uh, we have probably, we're probably going to have two more next spring and would be looking for, forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a